yeah. Um, I think, yeah, so Kayla will join in in a bit, but for now, I can, like, at least uh, outline, like, the work um, I've done so far. I will share my screen. Okay. okay. Um, can you guys see the Figma file? Yep. Okay. So basically, this? so basically this week, Kayla and I, we were exploring, uh, we were um, taking this time to explore the, like, and outline the user flow, basically, uh, basically focusing on particularly the call with um, the demo that Andre did with going to uh, using Mesh and also going through PubMed. And um, so what Kayla and I, we figured that we should do is like, we decided to, oh, it's gone. Well, basically, um, we wanted to focus on outlining the current flow for everything, you know, just for PubMed and, and base, et cetera. Um, and this would be a, like a great time to like kind of go through the user flow, the current user flow and um, pinpoint any user dilemmas and uh, any pain points that the user might have. And then our next steps was, uh, was to outline like, you know, how can we solve like these, like um, these pain points and dilemmas and outline that for like the user flow for Corona Y, like basically outlining how Corona Y can solve this current user dilemma and based on this previous flow. So I outlined the, the current user flow based on like Andre's process and also the great notes that like Matan did in the system right here. So, but yeah, so I'll just go through it. Um, let's see. This thing is weird. Uh, so the way that I divided the, um, the user flow is that like, in three different phases. Phases. So, the first phase is like kind of like going through using mesh and like um, coming up with the uh, the search um, string that Andre would come up with, um, and then also like and how he would input that into like PubMed, and then um, this like this basically outlines the whole process of going through like search like the search of, of all the papers that he sees and like determining whether or not like each paper title or whatever is like relevant. To to them, to him, and then this is a process of basically like going through the each paper itself, um, more specifically detail um, to extract data. So starting with mesh, like, um, let's see. So I think the given keywords, primary keywords that he was uh, given was hydroxychloroquine, and also um, I think it was something related to uh, heart diseases. So. What he would do is like you would enter like that keyword, that specific keyword into the search bar in mesh, and it would give him a list of related entry um, entry terms uh, that are related to hydroxychloroquine, for example. And he, um, there's also a, like a term tree, basically like uh, I wish I had access to it right now, but basically like some sort of a term tree where it gives him like other uh, relevant keywords, and uh, he would go through like each or like scan through like these entry terms to see which one is relevant or not. Um, with the way that user flows uh, work is like, you know, there's like a certain, this symbol like indicates like whether a user, like uh, a question that the user might have, if like, uh, if they make the decision, like, is this entry term uh, relevant? If it's no, they would just keep on looking through these, uh, skimming through these entry terms. If yes, they would, uh, at least in Andre's case, he would like move on to using this specific entry term. And um, for him, he put these terms into like some, I think it's a, uh, a notepad or a text editor, um, and this and as he's gathering like these um, entry terms that are relevant to him, he would. I think uh, Kayla added these, but as he's gathering these relevant entry terms, he would basically use this do this process of creating a search string um, with those terms. And once he is satisfied with that, he would he would move on to PubMed. Let's see. He would move on to PubMed, and then he would enter that search string into the search bar. Um, I think so. After he uh, enters that search string, um, he gets all these results. And I think the first thing he does is check the number of papers in the search results. So in that demo, I think it was about 75 um, articles based on the search string that he put, and he decided that number was acceptable. Like it's not too many, um, or it's like enough that he can go through. It's not like thousands of papers. Um, and that that's like the moment where like a user is like, oh, is this number acceptable to me? If it's not, if it's too much. Or too little, I will um, I will adjust the filters accordingly. Um, but for him, it was acceptable, and this is where basically starts to um, go through all these results and like scan through all these titles uh, and decide whether or not, like read through them quickly to decide whether or not the relevant um, these titles are relevant to him. Uh, um, and this would involve like 
you know, um, going through each title, seeing if it's relevant or not to him. If he sees one that is relevant, he'll select the paper and it'll navigate him to the paper summary where it includes things like the title and the abstract and um, authors and things like that. Um, he would briefly read the abstract. Um, and if he reads it, he decides it's not relevant to him, he will go back and start over uh, to the search results and, you know, move on to the next uh, possibly relevant paper. If, it is, if he reads this abstract and he decided it is relevant to him, he would download the PDF. And for him, he would put the PDF in a folder. Um, and once he decides that he has enough papers like in this folder um, that he decides are relevant to him, um, he'll move on to the next phase, which is basically the data extraction phase. Um, basically viewing the paper, uh, going through each paper and viewing it in the PDF viewer. Um, and this is like where it starts to get like, um, it starts to like, so he would, this is where he starts to read through the paper and looking for metadata and granular information. Um, this is where it starts to get to a point where some of the, the, um, the particular like data that he's looking for might depend on like the type of study or paper that he's reading. Like for example, I think in the demo, he mentioned that um, he noted that like with review studies, for example, he's not expecting much information from tables in the paper. Um, and instead of that, he would just go straight to the methods section first, and then he'll check the results of that paper. Um, but it seemed like for the most part that, well, once he starts looking into um, the papers, um, he would go straight to the tables so he could look for information, like metadata and like information such as this, such as these. Um, but yeah, so once he gets to that point, he would highlight this information for da and data for data extraction. And then I think he mentioned that he would put these all on a spreadsheet um, and organize all this data that he found from these papers. So yeah, so far that's like the whole process, at least like our main takeaways from how he approaches this, uh, this whole process. Um, I would say like my main takeaway for, as I was like, uh, as we were outlining this is that there were a lot of moments where the user will ask themselves, is this relevant? Like, is this thing relevant to me, to my search? And that's like, I think it has some notes on that here somewhere. Yeah, so there are a lot of moments in the user flow that involve the question, is this relevant or not? Um, and then that got, then led me to the question, like, what are the specific factors that help a user determine whether or not an entry term or a title or abstract or paper is relevant to them? And that probably depends. I'm assuming that depends on the research what the research question is or what's the intention of their search. Um, and then, so, and I also had the question, how might we address this issue such that the user does not have to spend so much time and effort trying to determine whether or not something is truly relevant to them. I had this question because at some point um, in the demo, Andre, he, he noted that he had concerns on whether our literature review tool or, a tool or AI driven tool could help them make these decisions because he said, quote unquote, it's not an easy task to make these decisions like determining res relevance. Um, but yeah, so at least for me personally, I think, um, actually, no, I don't have any more comments, but yeah, that was basically um, some of the things that I've done regarding the user flow. Um, do you guys have any questions or comments? Amazing or... work of putting it all together. Uh, this, very... this was the most fun thing to do. <laughs> I, I really enjoyed doing the user flows, but um, yeah, thanks. <laughs> it really uh, helps. There might be you. moments where, yeah, so, oh, sorry. But, but yeah, there were, there were moments where I, I'm not 100% sure if this is the particular step that they take just because of my limited knowledge. But if anything, this helped me a lot um, understand the process. So. Yeah, and I think the yeah. way you uh, kind of separated it into three sections it, and these um, logic boxes where you, you have the questions really pinpoint the main, um, I would say, low-hanging fruits that we should attempt to be solving. And obviously, we, we don't have uh, any expectation of like completely solving uh, the, the complexity of, of finding the relevant paper, but we can minimize the time and maximize the confidence of the user that the paper is relevant. And this is something that he should be spending more time on. Um, because basically the first step is for us to make sure that we can help user construct the most relevant query, the one um, that doesn't require him to combining strings and using the and and or operators 
and just having the user interface where they they can click and select um, things, the, the actual terms and the terms that are close um, by some metrics to those terms. And this way we can simplify this whole first step ideally. So um, this is, you know, this is how it's currently done. And our success date is to transform it in just a couple of clicks versus going back and forth, copy pasting from MASH and any other uh, ontologies. Uh, that would be the ultimate win for this step, the first one. And obviously the, the question if uh, the entry term is relevant is something that we would try and maximize uh, you know, the probability of that being true. Um, and as we build and improve on the system and have more feedback, we would be able to further improve on that. And the second stage, um, I, I like how you added the question, if the number of papers is um, acceptable. I think that's a very good one that we, we may also solve through the um, UI um, indicators or something like, you know, when there's just uh, 10 papers and they, they barely mention uh, these terms, there could be like a, a good signal um, for this um, search query. If there is plenty of stuff, there would be, um, you know, another type of indicator, like a bar or something that we could uh, showcase to the user and further explain why it's a weak signal or a strong signal based on the, the amount of information that we have um, uh, on the extracted um, data from the papers. So let me give you an example. If a user goes through the first step, uh, construct um, a very complex uh, combination of keywords like hydroxychloroquine, um, covalescent plasma, and something else. And as a result, there is only 15 papers and um, they mention some of these keywords sporadically, um, not all together, not um, in, in the actual uh, bodies or, or something. The, there, there has to be some heuristic for us to utilize in here, but we would be able to immediately explain to uh, the user, the researcher that, hey, this query is, is e either touching on the, on the areas that are not yet uh, documented and researched, or they're not, um, Specific, there are two specific, and they would benefit from, um, you know, adjusting that query. Um, further on, we could also recommend, like, hey, if you remove this term, you would get like hundred more papers or or something like that. And this is something that I think could be utilized as um, UI method of guiding the user at this stage. The second one. Is this title relevant? I think this one is actually more on the on what we can extract from the paper to showcase if the paper is relevant besides just the title, because the title is is the only way basically. Uh, well, the title and the abstract, the only ways um, researchers are assessing the results in PubMed and other. Um, uh, places without getting deep into the article. If we can bubble up the information that could be the most um, uh, informative for them, like uh, bubbling up the geolocation, hey, this paper is from Italy. If we can bubble up that this paper is using the animal model for uh, the actual experiments, or if this paper is using the uh, human studies or uh, any kind of uh, additional tags or like highlights um, under the title of the paper. I think this um, this would be a tremendous help for the researcher to exercise this question, like if this paper is relevant to me based on all of this metadata that we can extract from the papers. And obviously as we build on more comprehensive classifiers to be able to identify that this paper is, um, using the some specific method of um, analysis or specific or specific materials are being used in uh, are being studied in this paper we could further on build up um, kind of a list of 
things that we bubble up to this uh, list view. Um, but I think that's that's also something that we could solve with uh, uh, UI in terms of subtle um, bubbles or tags that show up on the list view. Does it make sense? Yeah, that all makes sense. Um, I had a thing I was going to say, but I forgot. But yeah, that, that sounds really great. Um, I think. Uh, and at, at the last step, I would actually add up that uh, the third process is also something that we would be able to help out was just uh, utilizing the current architecture that we have in terms of extracting things like sample size, uh, year of study, country of study, all of these things. So researchers spend way less time uh, scouting through the PDFs and um, extracting all of these um, other parameters like study type, study design, and um, other, other points of reference that they will obviously combine in a spreadsheet further on. And the idea here for the MVP and for the initial stage of our um, project, we we aim to extract as much as possible, even if there might be some inaccuracies in the data. And um, for, for us to present that in a cohesive form for the researchers to, um, you know, essentially if they spend 15 minutes less on each paper and they have to do 10 papers, that's already plenty of time saved. That is, yeah, even if it's just a few minutes saved, it's just, you know, at least like if we if we were to cert, uh, set like certain metrics, um, let's just say in the future, well, I don't know, like, I'm not sure how long it took for, it would it usually takes for Andre, for example, to go through this whole process. But later on, if we are able, when we go through user testing and have um, epidemiologists try out like any like MVP, MVP that we have or any like prototype we have, like if we were to cert, set certain metrics, um, like if even if it's just like a few minutes less than it would usually take like that would be a great way of like measuring like the success of like at least yeah, like, tell absolutely. us like whether whether or not we're going in the right direction so yeah yeah the worst case scenario takes more time <laughs> yeah basically <laughs> but yeah um i'm not sure i have any comments do does anyone else have any comments or questions also share the uh, uh i have a quick question so where is the link for this figma yeah actually i was about to like share it because i think the link is somewhere it's somewhere <laughs> but um to make it easier for you guys i can add it to the chat so that would be great yeah um you should be able to view this this way perfect yeah, uh, just having it all in, in the one flow chart makes it way easier to um, kind of build the mental model of what happens where. And the logic boxes are also super helpful. Um, I think what would be beneficial at this stage um, is potentially crafting some like mockups that reference specific stages of this flow chart uh, in terms of imaginary solution. Um, what do you guys think? Sorry, can you uh, explain that a little bit more? So, so in terms, some mock -ups, uh, in, in terms yeah, of the, the first stage, um, obviously we, we had somewhat uh, some mockups that um, we created in, in Figma where you would click on the search bar and you would select from a list of uh, controlled vocabulary terms. I think, you know, just showcasing the, the success date um, for each of these steps would be a good way for us to kind of wrap our heads around how, how we imagine each of the steps being, you know, done uh, in the ideal scenario. Do you, do you mean, um... I'm, I'm, uh, can you clarify what you mean by steps? Do you mean um, in, in the- So uh, here so, we have so, these three steps, three okay, distinct okay. steps. Yeah. The first one, which is the actual, um, you know, input 
for the search engine. The second one is working was the list of results. And the third one uh, working was the further extraction of the data from the specific articles. I think having um, some imaginary um, mockups for each stage would be helpful um, in terms of how we would attempt to solve uh, these. Obviously super hard and challenging um, it, imaginary effort, but um, I think that that would be a great next step, um, unless you guys have um, that planned out further on. Nicole? Uh, yeah, we kind of do. I think, well, something that Kia and I we were thinking of, because right now we have the current user flow outline, like Andre's process. And then after that, we were to, uh, I guess, like, Kayla can speak more to this, but uh, basically, like, outlining and. Uh, oh, okay. I don't want to say, like, a more. I, I don't yeah. know if it's necessarily a, a more ideal like user flow, but just something, a, a new flow to just kind of like help simplify or um, like this process or make it less complex or at least make it uh, easier for the user uh, or more seamless for the user. And then at this point, like once we have this established, we can like look into making these sort of mockups. Um, that makes sense. Have, yeah, having like this sort of like flow outlined after um, outlining this flow would help a lot with like what you're saying about making these mockups, which is, you know, yeah, basically like that we have that plan in mind, just um, uh, having, but having this in mind first would help a lot with that process uh, prior to that. So, yeah. <laughs> All right. um, just to chime in really quickly. Hi, and thank you for waiting so patiently. I wanted to ask um, two things. So forgive me because I'm coming in late. I don't want to repeat anything, but um, are you asking for wireframes or are you asking for um, mockups? So what I was uh, referring to, because um, Nicole was showcasing the um, the fully documented full chart um, with the Andre experience, and I was thinking um, of creating something that visualizes the ideal um, ideal way of addressing each of the stages, the, the three stages. And I think uh, what you guys are showing right now is um, probably a better way to address it for the first step, just to make sure we're aligned on all of these things. But um, this, and let me actually zoom in. Yeah, so you're kind of taking the, the same structure and um, making it a more seamless experience. And then we can uh, basically um, chunk out each of these stages and imagine a potential solution in terms of visuals. Okay, that makes sense to me. So I'm wondering if, cause her and I, and now we're kind of wrapping up, we're coming towards the end of, um, that schedule that we had mapped out. So I think the next deadline is, if I'm not mistaken, the 22nd for lo-fi wireframes. Um, I'm wondering if maybe what we can do um, is build off of this. And then actually, I guess this is something that her and I will, you guys can also chime in, but whether we should establish like a features list because the way that her and I have worked on worked on things in the past has been like we'll do the research the preliminary research we'll do personas and then we'll do a flow and then we'll do like a features list based on the flow and that'll kind of help us articulate like what a site map would be or um, like the things the items that correspond to all of the tasks that are specified within the user flow so that we have like a skeleton to refer to um, so I feel like what I'm trying to say is that we should do the lo-fi wireframes and also have like a corresponding like features list and site map kind of a thing so that we have a really like clear sense of the like the architecture of things. Um, I know for me that makes it easier. Does that make sense to you, Nicole? Yeah, like in at least like in regards to like the other project that we've been working on, um, making the features list first uh based on like the user flow or like in, con in conjunction with the user flow helps a lot with the um like designing the lo-fi wireframe so i think that's a good idea um yeah <laughs> okay i'm gonna put really quickly because i realized it's not documented and it's probably confusing last meeting that we had um i think matan or someone was saying we should um not prioritize 
the visual concept view, if you will, like the the actual graph. Yes. Now. Yes. So okay. I would say because I listened to that uh, recording, and I would say I completely agree with um, starting off with a simpler representation of the same concept, which is basically showcasing the the terms that are um, either closer or whatever metric that we establish uh, for the relevance of the um, input terms. So there is this other tool that I don't remember the name of it, but Andre also uh, showed us how they showcase a table, which is just a list of um, keywords and their relevancy just as a score, um, like 0 0.9, 0 0.8. So we can basically take the same graph for representation and transform it in just a list of things that are the closest and by putting them at the top. Okay, cool. So that makes sense to me. Um, I think, okay, so the only other thing I was going to say, um, okay, so with that in mind, I, this wasn't something that I had mentioned yet to Nicole, um, why did that turn yellow? Okay, anyway, this was something that I wanted to talk to you guys about and get some mm -hmm. feedback on. The way that I had thought about it was that if the, if there's like a graphic view or like a, something that's more visual, kind of like the iris AI example or the line example, um, I was wondering if there should be like two views then, like there should be a view that's abstract focused and very similar to what we see on like PubMed when you run a search, and then a secondary view that is like what we've been talking about in a more visual sense where you can identify one concept um, and then see all of the like hypernyms or I guess the synonyms really or like the smaller categories that fall within those like larger umbrella categories, like maybe those should be um, two separate things. Whereas I think on the iris example, it's just the latter. There's no, I don't think that there's like a typical search like PubMed, but I thought that those two views would like solve the problem. Does that make sense? Yeah. And if, if we'll be able to kind of reduce complexity and still showcase the, the graph representation, um, that sounds great. Okay, great. Um, so I just had, before I forget, I had like two general like housekeeping questions. So I've only been on a couple of calls with you guys and I have a pretty good sense of like who everyone is, but I was just curious to know more about like how the team is structured and who is responsible for what tasks, because as her and I um, proceed, as we all proceed, it's really useful for me to know, um, because if I want to maybe recommend additional steps in this whole process, it would be great to be like, hey, um, so and so I can maybe you can like do this task and I think it makes it more efficient, you know. <laughs> Efficiency. Oh, that one. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I would say it's gonna that be fun. I'm just going to watch this on unravel right in front of me. <laughs> yeah, since we're, you know, a, a distributed uh, community, it's sometimes a little bit hard to identify specific, um, let's say, people that are responsible for action items. But I would say that it really depends on the scope. If it's um, a task that would require NLP and the machine learning side of things, uh, we have Alex, uh, we have Matan that can help uh, figure out whether it's possible, whether that's uh, something that uh, makes sense from the technology standpoint. If it's something uh, that pertains to potential uh, web integrations and connecting things together, Anton uh, would be able to help. I would be able to chime in on, on both AI, machine learning and web side of things. Um, when it comes to, let's say, uh, design and UI UX things, we would just rely on you guys to, to drive that point. Um, what other areas are you, are you thinking in terms of the responsibilities? Um, all of that makes sense to me. I think I had that question because it was coming from a place of like, all of my previous experience has been in a very like specific um, UX, UI, PM, and like developer format, if you will. So it's yeah. always been like, I hand off my work 
to someone and then I have someone who's setting a schedule above me and I abide by those deadlines, I'll let them know when I can or if something comes up and things might be reformatted. But for the most part, I'm just very used to having like a handoff with a developer. Um, yeah. Does it make we sense? Don't well, no, it's completely not normal to have that sort of approach because obviously most places you'll have worked for will have been a company and then that company will have had a hierarchy and a structure and a system and a process and you'll have been like, this person does it, then that person does it and that, that person does it and they've got very specific roles that they're defined for because they're paid for. We don't have any of that of any way, shape or form. We have skills that people can bring to bear. We have an inclination to people for people to be interested in but um there is absolutely no power or differentiation between anyone's ability because we're all volunteers obviously if someone um can bring to bear expertise or experience that's useful um people will normally defer to them in the sense that like you sound like you know what you're doing and i'll leave you to it but very few people would end up telling you to not do something if you felt capable but at the same time, it's good to ask. And we're all we're all basically learning from each other in nearly every way. Even in even in a domain like where Arta is, you know, considered quite uh, quite uh, expertised in AI technologies, he's still learning from other people who because there's no one can know everything. And we all admit this. So the difference is is um no no one's your boss and no one's ever gonna be your boss. <laughs> So you've got to learn how to kind of be comfortable with that level of instability. I mean, by all means, we all, we're all we always happy to help each other where we can and step up and clarify things, but no one's going to tell you what to do and no one's going to tell you to this is what you should do. You kind of have to volunteer and sign up and then learn how to motivate and keep yourself in the mix and ask yeah. questions. But I would say that, you know, we are here to, to guide that structure that, um, you know, the structure that most closely resembles that what you guys are used to. Uh, I come from a traditional, you know, corporate environment, startup environment. So I totally understand what, what you're looking for. I would say as we move closer to the wireframes and mockups, it will be um, probably easier to uh, get people committed to specific uh, action items because when, when it's an abstract idea, it's very hard for people to understand what, what specific action items and what specific responsibilities they uh, would be committing to. And it's way easier when we have specific um, areas outlined and specific parts of the functionality uh, streamlined. Yeah, and uh, if I can also add, uh, I wanted, uh, Kyla, so uh, I have uh, actually already developed a website for CoronaVy uh, for the spike protein interface. Uh, I can share it, I'll share it in the chat. Uh, and uh, I, I'll be ha happy to help with the you know web uh, interface uh, part uh, if if that's uh, that's something that, that that's of interest. So um, I'm, I'm just uh, putting it in the chat. And um, so this is uh, you can have a look at uh, this site if you like. It just it's it's not related to the literature review, but it's uh, it's a explorer for like the spike protein and the epitopes, uh, which is could be interest oh. of vaccine researchers. So yeah, I mean, I also come from a corporate interface. Uh, right now, not in a corporate inter. Uh, I mean, system, uh, but um, four four not found. How oh, come? Uh, oh, oh, wait a second. Like, there's something weird that happens. Just, uh, just use this part. So, um, okay, this will work. Can you can you just try? There's some there's some issue with that. Like it 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 lands up with the. Um, with uh, some 404, like when you when you uh, when you don't have the. Uh, I worked out pretty quickly. It's fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so. Uh, I mean, I can screen share, but uh, and show you like how to navigate. Uh, but, but the bo bottom line is, um, if you like, like you know, we can uh, have a interface, and then Anton has helped me deploy it. So this is like a framework that's already there. It's an Angular front end and a Django back end. Uh, so there's processing that uh, occurs in the back end and then there's uh, um, like asynchronous like uh, responsive like javascript front end which uh, takes care of the results so thank yeah. you yeah thank you for sharing that i really appreciate that um that insight so i think that makes sense and then um what was i gonna say i think going forward i'm also just uh 
going to say after this call, I'll have a brief chat with Nicole about what the next tasks will be after the wireframes. Um, and it's most useful if, if um, I wonder if this is a good format to get feedback. Um, sometimes there isn't always too many like minutes during these meetings to get like really granular feedback. So maybe what we can do is we can have these meetings and then in addition, my work and Nicole's work will always be in the Figma file or in whatever else we work with. Um, thank you for fixing the mural board, by the way. Um, and so I can post this in Slack and then maybe we can get feedback that way, just because I feel like um, I don't want anything to like fall through the cracks, if you know what I mean. Yeah, that sounds like fun and as asynchronous feedback would definitely work. I mean, I'm, I've got a week off next week. Uh, schools are closed, so I'm going to be a bit more available next week. And I'm going to see if I can reacquaint myself with a bit more of the Corona Y work. Because as we've talked, Anton and I were talking earlier, that um, it's really hard to know what's going on right now because so many people are so quiet, even though there's things going on. It's just not many people are updating each other. And we need to try and work out again how to tease that knowledge and that information of what's going on so we can better understand how people can help each other. Um, and yeah, I, I really would like to have a catch up with Kyla because of Kayla, I've only seen her in the, the calls and I definitely want, I wanted to be more involved with the UX stuff, but I've just not been able to fit in and also do my course and have a job and mm -hmm. deal with life. <laughs> yeah, just... no, I totally understand. I'm available. I'm on the Eastern time zone. I'm in New York. So my schedule is pretty open. I work with a lot of people on the West coast, so I'm okay. With I... Yeah, I'm I'm in the UK, so my time zone's closer to yours than it is to them, to them guys. Okay, okay. So if if anybody, um, this is something that I think is like a good practice anyway. It helps me a lot. If you want to like talk to me about something or there's something on your end, um, if we could like bridge the gap there, I'm always happy to connect. So you can just shoot me a message on Slack and that's fine. Cool. Um, okay, I wonder if I know we went through Nicole's um, flow, but would it be helpful if I went through mine? It's a little bit more, um, it's a lot shorter, but would that be helpful? Yes, please. Okay, cool. So I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Um, so I'll start off by saying I looked at what was um, in the notes that Matan took for Andre's call, and I also looked at what um, Nicole mapped out, and it seemed to me that there were like three definitive phases. So there's the phase where you're trying to identify or like create your search string. And then there's when you're actually like engaging with the engine itself and trying to like identify the relevant um, articles. And that has like a host of different things. So you're trying to like parse through metadata and then also trying to understand um, whether something is actually relevant by reading the abstracts and there's a lot of click throughs there. Um, and then at the end, there's like when you're, this to me was interesting. So maybe Nicole, you can, we spoke about this a little bit, but then afterwards I had some questions for you. Um, I thought about this and I was confused because I didn't understand why metadata would be extracted towards the end as opposed to the beginning. Um, so technically, uh, in our ideal scenario, this data would be extracted um, and presented during the search view. But since you know the, the current systems like PubMed and others are not extracting that data, like sample size and other things from the papers, uh, researchers have to do it manually um, by reading the entire article and going back and forth and compiling all of that into a spreadsheet. Okay, okay, that makes sense. So this is also something that we would ideally help uh, reduce the, the time spent on, on this activity by, um, by first of all, identifying which things we're ex extracting and bubbling up, and also making sure that uh, researchers don't end up adding articles that seem to be relevant by the title and the abstract, but further on when they dig into the actual paper, the PDF, and they find out that, hey, this paper is actually uh, studying the, the, the mouse uh, model and experiments on animals, not on humans. Uh, when in reality, that could have been identified by machine learning algorithms and bubbled up in the search view in a list um, of articles by having like an animal studies tag or something like that. 
Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That makes sense to me. Okay, cool. Um, okay, so now that you mentioned that, I have things that I'll ask in a moment, but I organized it into three phases. So the first being pre-search, the second being search, and the third being post-search. I don't think we've spoke about post-search so much, but we'll get into that. So I'll zoom in. Can you see this clearly? Yep. Okay. I can't because my Zoom is taking up half my screen, but okay. So the idea is that you would enter an initial keyword and then locate related entry terms. So those would be either be um, hypernyms or synonyms or things that are like the mesh headings. Um, and then you would identify the terms that are the most related to what it is that you're searching for. Um, and then create a search string that would include the appropriate terms. And I forgot to mention this, but this would also be a place where you would have like and or not. And then I think there's something else like truncation where you can just, I think it's like you have everything except for the suffix or the prefix of a word. So that would also be here. Um, and then you would specify filters, but I put that this would be optional because I was thinking um, perhaps if the person that was like doing this research um, didn't want to specify like the metadata just yet, but they were like more in like an exploratory mindset, then they wouldn't have to specify the feature, so it would be optional. But the purpose of this being here is that the filters would allow you to specify, like, I'm concerned with sample size, I'm concerned with research design, I'm concerned with, like, these kinds of things so that you don't end up finding an article that's, like, completely irrelevant to all of that. Um, and then you would run it. And then I didn't put anything for the visual concept view. So that here is like to be decided. Um, but then you would go on and I put that this was ab an abstract focused list view, um, honestly, mainly because of the interview that you guys had had with Chloe because she specified um, a big pain point for her was that there was a lot of click through. So I thought if we're thinking about how to be the most effectual in, for the sake of like time efficiency, like being able to hover over something um, and read an abstract rather than clicking on it, reading the abstract, looking at the metadata, these are all time consuming things. So right there, I feel like it's two birds with one stone because you already knocked out the metadata with the filtering in the beginning. Like, um, yeah, ideally. And then the second part of that would be now you don't have to keep clicking through and looking at abstracts and trying to determine, well, okay, the location and the sample size and all of that is correct, but now I really need to understand um, if this is actually relevant. So, so there's here, <laughs> and this is a good point, and this is something that I was trying to uh, bring more um, awareness of in the previous question. Ideally, this abstract view acts not just uh, as a text, but also as these like bubbles, these tags that extract um, relevant information and pinpoint specific um, entities, specific uh, classifications, and the data that would not be uh, otherwise read unless they download the PDF and stumble upon it and realize that, hey, this article is completely irrelevant. So this is ideally we we thought of it being just like tags on top of the the article that um, acts as a as a quick extraction of the most important things that we are capable of extracting be it the study type be it the um, origin of the of the um, data or if it's a clinical trial uh, query or the the filter goes into the clinical trials only that showcases the, the data that pertains to the clinical trials, like age, sample size, and other things. So treating the abstract view as also the augmentation of the paper was the, the metadata that in a typical process is extracted way after the, the search. Does it make sense? Well, the other one is Uh, Matan, are you saying something? We couldn't really hear you. I was about to. Um, <laughs> trying to process a lot right now. Uh, um, I, I, I have this. So, all right, so let me back up. So, one of my first thoughts was uh, whether or not we should spend some time trying to really, um, really. Uh, um, 
identify or um, lay out the first three goals of the MVP. Because um, I feel like some of my explanation in the last call may have conflicted a little bit with yours previously in this call, um, mainly about the metadata, which I had felt was one of the first things we were going for. Um, but I could be wrong, so I, I think maybe we should maybe clarify that, try that home yeah. for me also. Um, and then something else is just popping in my head is the type of a really flexible pivot table. Um, the more we talk about this, that's just like this idea just popping up in my head. And I guess I just want to explain that the way that I use it happening is, um, or the user's experience is typing in you know, one search term that will, um, to your idea, bubble up some abstracts with different search terms. And you can use those bubbles as sort of additional criteria to filter and create different um, sort of pivot table views that you think that's important to you, right? And that, that in my mind makes this extremely customizable and, and um, uh, gives you the complexity the user needs, um, but while remaining tailored to their focus. Does that make sense? Um, I'm, a bit, sorry yeah. to you. I'm just a little bit confused with that description only because I just need to have a really clear understanding of like, because because this right now that we're talking about, it moves away, like it moves me away from this idea that metadata should be specified in the traditional way that I understand, like as filters from the very beginning of the flow. And it actually makes it like a simultaneous action. So when you're reading through the abstracts, you're also extracting whether the metadata is relevant, if I'm understanding that correctly. So it's like a simultaneous action as opposed to something that happens in the beginning of the flow. So I'm trying to understand if that's correct. Does that make sense? And you're right. And uh, some of these things are probably, um, you know, should be considered to be dynamically added to the filters, like on the right uh, sidebar or something. But there will be um, a lot of information that is not really designed to be filterable. Um, like if there is, um, for example, the type of material that is studied for the papers that are investigating the surfaces and stability of the virus and surfaces, um, there would be a little tag that would say um, like surface semicolon metal or something uh, on the, the abstract uh, section. But it's not really the thing that you would imagine uh, researchers filtering by because it's not a common, um, common filtering uh, item, but it would be helpful. It's too, spe it's too specific in the early stage to say, well, I'm definitely looking for metal. But when you start looking, when you start looking for the materials, then you can go actually a yeah, metal I'm looking at and you can click on it and then it can start filtering from the, basically it goes back to this idea of discovering what you want to find as you are finding things. It is a, it is a feedback loop. And yeah, I understand why you, it, the idea of there being the filters at the beginning, is the most like traditional way of doing it. But the whole idea is it's a, it's a feedback loop of like every decision refinement you make refines the process and it, and it loops back around in its own way. And I think some of the filters are absolutely necessary to be defined for the very beginning, but um, more on the, on the side of these dynamic extractions will be basically uh, acting as a supporting information for this process of uh, answering the question, is this article relevant? This is not really a filter. This is additional data that supports the, the, that question. Basically, if I see that there is a, um, it's an animal study and I'm looking just for, for human studies, I may have not necessarily had that filter at the very beginning, but it helps me um, scout, uh, crawl through the, the papers way faster and identify only those that are relevant to my search. But, yeah, you know, in, in, there might be yeah. scientists that are actually looking for animal studies. I mean, exactly that. It's, 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 we don't want to make it that you have to think of everything you need to think of at the beginning. We need to get people into discovering the information they're looking for with maybe a rough idea, like say one term and any of the synonyms that are connected to it. And they're going to be like, okay, they're in the first stage of it. And they might go, well, actually I'm only looking for, you know, 
these types of studies. So I could, I could select that as a filler. And once you get in, you'd be like, oh, actually, yeah, within this study section, there is animal models and there are human models and there is animal mouse models male. Well, I don't need that. I can completely cut that away. I don't need anything that's a mouse model. I can get rid of that. But I didn't think of that because that was like asking me to think of too many things at the beginning. So I could be like, oh, I don't need that. That we can refine, you know, can remove anything that's got that tag. And, and what, that Tyler, again, refine. what Tyler mentioned by uh, them being clickable, I think that would be the great next step. But for now, let's just assume we we're only displaying them. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Matan mentioned that as well. So I definitely, that's sort of his place on that one. Okay, so that makes sense. So then the question that I had um, as a follow up, I know that this isn't something that maybe we're doing for the MVP just yet, but is whether the if there's a direct relationship between those tags that you're describing and like the hypernyms or broader categories um, that would be used for the visual view kind of like the iris AI example. Yeah, that's a tricky one. I, I, I feel like if I was gonna, if I was gonna like visualize it in my mind, I, I feel like I'd have like, I'd have like tags that are these big tags, big descriptive tags. But then you would be pulling out this metadata, which, which would be much like lower hierarchy tags, or like much more specific that you're not gonna be able to search for because it's just, it's just too specific. Sometimes you know it might mention gene types or something, which is fine. But if you type in a gene type, you're probably gonna get like five papers and that'd be it so it's a case of um there probably would be things that would be part of that grouping structure which would be this like hypernyms and this this synonyms idea tags and they would be i imagine in ones that would be more like the metadata just as a way of refining things away and i don't know if they'd be displayed as separate things they'd be displayed as one space with color coding i don't know how you'd visualize it to make it visible but a way of Basically, the idea is to try and get as much information as quickly, but as succinctly, so people can work out, do I need this, do I not? Which is what Artis said. It's like, is this useful? Is this not? That's the question. And if they want to, we want to get the people to work out if it's useful or not to what they're researching as quickly as possible, so we can refine faster and faster down to what they need. Okay, cool. That that makes sense to me. It's starting to come together, and I'm glad that these calls are recorded because I can always reflect back. Um, I just want to check in with Nicole briefly. Is this making sense to you? Um, I hope that it is. Sorry, my mic is acting weird. But anyway, yeah, um, I have the same thoughts. Like, it's making more sense to me, but I would also need to like look back at the recording. So, because um, that was a lot of information <laughs> just now. So. But yeah, it's it's really helpful. Okay, cool. So I'm sorry, was somebody saying something? Yeah, I was just gonna ask you to try and further clarify also for myself or Arthur and Tyler what what it would be fair to say that we could look at the tags. Um You break you're breaking up pretty badly for me that my town. You know, the amount of money I spend on headphones. Uh, at this rate, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna buy you a mic, it'd probably be easier. <laughs> Uh, That's way better, but yeah. <laughs> I did do it for a second. It sounded great for a second. I don't hear anything. Maybe you can type because I want to know what you have to say. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to start typing. Cool. <laughs> Don't we like listening to you, Matan. Don't say things like that. Um, where's the, is this a Figma piece that you're working in right now? Yeah. Do you want the link? Um, yeah, I won't mind the link so I can add it into my Figma links. Uh, sure. Um, should I let you edit this or should I only let you view it? Let's see. Okay. Um, copy the link and go here. Tags would be like a heat map. Mm. 
actually currently the settings are anyone with the link can add it. So the granule permissions don't make that much sense. I'm sorry, were you saying something about editing? I couldn't hear so you. So on, on Figma, like right now, the settings are anyone with the link can edit. So the rest of the granular control, like doesn't make sense. So oh, everybody that's could fine. Edit anyway. Yeah, no, that's totally fine. You guys can do whatever you need to with the work. Um, but the, oh, the I'll just emphasize, um, it's actually very, it's probably better if you can edit because I don't think that there's a way like similar to Google Docs where you can like add comments. Um, but like we were saying before with the asynchronous feedback, it would be really great if you guys could. Um, I am confused about your question, Matan. I'm wondering if like there's no relationship between whether, like if there's no degree of variability, like if one tag is, um, like strongly corresponding to a specific article, whereas another one is not strongly corresponding to it, just because my understanding at this moment in time is that the tags are specific to the abstract. So they would have to be like, there would have to be a strong direct relationship. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think having a having couple of examples probably would, would help us all get on the same page, just taking a couple of articles and potentially uh, you know, just outlining. And just muck, mocking up what it might look like. Yeah. And this is like, this is this is an abstract. When we'd hover over it, this would pop out. We'd have the, you know, reading, literally reading the abstract and finding that the tags that are relevant to it so we could see what it would theoretically look like. I'll see if I can do that next week. Yeah, that'd be great. Okay, cool. So uh, a final thought, because I have to jump on a, call really quick with Nicole and then I have to go. Um, but a final thought, I put a couple of the tasks that we were doing on the Trello board. Um, I'm not sure if I can share it. I think I can. Um, I was so excited last week because I cleared out all of my tabs and all of my tabs are crazy again. But anyway, they're on that Trello. It's a, it's a fight I've given up on. It's just I've <laughs> given up. <laughs> Um, okay, wait, I'm going to share my screen so that it makes sense. This thing here. I don't know if everyone is on this. I'm not sure if Nicole, if you are, because I was trying to find your name and I couldn't find you, but um, maybe an invite has to be sent out. But the point being, um, I think it's good if we, this is a format that really helps me and Tyler so that we can connect maybe um, I can put the things that her and I have talked spoken about and also send you um, a message and get your feedback on the schedule and what you might be able to like chime in on and help with and then we can put it here so that we have like some format of how to work collaboratively. Does that work? Yeah, I'm literally just making sure it starts so it's in my list because I've got too many boards as it is, so I need to make sure it's at the top of my list. Otherwise, I will miss it, along with so many other things that I try and do. Um, so, yeah, Team Literature Review, I've got it there. I'll just have to, yeah, I'll keep an eye on it. I'm, it's always on, on my phone anyway, so I can see it on my phone and I can log on on the PC anyway. But, yeah, okay. if you could tag me, if you, if you tag me on things like that, it will notify me. Okay, sounds like a good plan. I'm gonna do some recon and go through this board because I haven't looked at it in a minute. Um, and I just want to make sure. What? Oh, <laughs> it's okay. Yeah, I said neither have I. It's up, yeah, up, clean up. <laughs> but yeah, Super tidy probably. Thanks a lot, Kyla and Nicole. Uh, amazing work. Um, please send the the links to the uh, Figma and Miro in Slack, um, just so everyone has those and looking forward for the next one okay cool enjoy the rest of your week you too thank you bye, -bye. everyone bye